good morning to you. Did any of you have any busted pipes this last week? Or loss of power? <clears throat> How many of you lost power this last week? You know, that's why we're at church today, right? So we can get the power of the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> that's why we're here, and that's better than the other kind. Well, let's all stand together and open our Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Uh, we've been in a series, this is the seventh sermon, entitled uh, Finding Freedom and Purpose for Life. And it's important that we understand what that means and how to find the freedom and purpose that God has for every single one of us. And the title of the message is Don't Give In and Don't Give Up. It's probably something we need to hear today, right? In the midst of the chaos of our world, specifically our country right now, it's, um, it's mind-boggling. And we look at all these things going on and say, okay, well, how can we make a difference? How can we be impactful for the Lord in a positive sense, even in the midst of uh, chaos going on in our world? Well, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning that we'll understand the depth of these words. And God, you're a great God, and you've done so many wonderful things. And I'm thankful that we're gathered here this morning in the name of Jesus. And I pray your blessing upon every single person right now in this room. And Father, I pray that you protect us and give us insight. And may we never feel like we've lost this war because we haven't. Lord, I pray that we'll always keep our eyes on you and realize there's always a calling to something greater than we are just by ourselves. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, before I get too far along, congratulations to Ken and Lisa Shockley. 45 years of marriage. Lisa was 12 when they got married. If you were approached by someone considerably younger than you, and they were to ask you, what kind of life advice would you give me? What are some words of wisdom, something you've learned through life that would help me in my life? Well, some people would say, you know what, life is short, so have a party. That's what you need to do. Just remember that your life is but a vapor that appears for a little while, and then it's just gone. It just vanishes away. That's what James tells us. Someone else might say, well, try to laugh more than you cry in life. Nothing wrong with that. Try to laugh more than you cry. I think part of our problem, especially today, is we take ourselves way too seriously, don't we? And people who take themselves too seriously are always upset about something. They're always down in the dumps about something because they see fault and negativity in everything that they look at. Someone else might say, live your life in such a way that at night when you lay your head on your pillow, you can sleep with a clean conscience. Nothing wrong with that. But there's one piece of advice that I would share that I think is really important, and here it is. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. And far too often we see people, even those who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that really waste their opportunities to make a difference for the Lord in this world. Don't come to the end of your life and find it full of regrets. Some things we look back now, in fact, I would say to you, how many of you have ever had a regret in your life? Would you raise your hand? How many of you wish you would have tried something? You never tried it, but you wish you had have tried something, and you just didn't have the courage to do it? We've all been there. 
And so don't wind up at the end of your life full of regrets. And don't wind up with words that you never said that you should have said. Don't wind up the end of your life with a lack of forgiveness in your heart because we've all needed forgiveness in our own lives, right? From someone else to forgive us, and we're supposed to forgive others, right? Well, I can't forgive them, some people say. Yes, you can. You're choosing not to forgive them. So don't wind up on your deathbed thinking, man, I should have asked so-and-so for forgiveness. I should have apologized to them. I just didn't do it. Don't end up your life not living for Jesus. Tell you two stories. You tell me which one is the tragedy. John Bassanio, who was the pastor of First Baptist Church Houston for many, many years, I think 35, 36, 37 years, long time, was one of my mentors. I've eaten in his home many times, Robin and I have. His wife's name was Aldine, and, and we would go over there, and she'd always have a nice meal to, to fix, and And they always had a little poodle, and, you know, through the years, they might have had two or three different ones. I don't know. But anyway, uh, we'd go over there, and Aldine would say, the little dog's name, I think it was Maggie, actually, Maggie, it's time to eat. And Maggie would run right to the ottoman, put his little paws up there about his head. She trained that dog to do that. They had a beautiful home, and every stick of furniture in that home was an antique. Everything was a lifetime of collecting. Everything was antiques. Even the rug underneath your feet, huge rug. As you walked into the, the den area, it was an antique rug. And they, they were very proud of their antiques. And they loved the, the chase, you know, hunting them down and capturing another antique for their collection. They, they enjoyed that. Old Dean was a health freak. She exercised every day. She ate everything you're supposed to eat to stay healthy. John... Loved to eat fried foods. One time, John was a big old boy. You ever saw him? Old Dean got cancer. She had brain cancer. Hurricane Harvey comes. And for the first time in 40 years, their house flooded. Never had flooded before. The flood was so bad, they had to take a little boat Get old Dean and put her in the boat to get her out of there. So old Dean goes to the hospital from her home. Every stick of furniture they had spent their lifetime collecting was totally ruined. All of it was ruined. And then John gets sick himself. And he goes to live with his son. Now, I think he lived in Tennessee. I'm not sure about that, but some other state. So he goes to live with his son in some other state, and then John passed away. Have you ever known anyone that was a faithful servant of God, and it seems like the end of their life was just one tragedy after another, after another, after another? And you find yourself asking God, why would you allow this to happen? They've been faithful servants. What a tragedy, we might say. There was a man who was an attorney, built a huge house out of Bethel Acres. I don't know how many square feet it was. I'm going to guess it was eight, nine, ten thousand square feet. It was huge, a huge home. And he had a guest home on top of that. Bunch of acreage. Had a collection of prized thoroughbred horses. The kind that cost a lot of money. He had nice cars, nice pickups, nice trailers for his horses. He had a sports car, too. He had all the toys that a man could ever want. But when he died, he died without Jesus. I'd witnessed to him multiple times, and every time he would reject the Lord. So he died without Jesus. Now imagine both of them standing before God. And God looks at John Bassanio and says, John, what did you do with your life? And John looks at the Lord and says, well, Lord, I preached the word. I shared your grace with people, as many as I could possibly share your grace with. And I remained faithful to you until I drew my last breath. And then God looks at that attorney and says, what did you do with your life? And that attorney says, well, I made made millions of dollars. I had a huge house. 
I had hundreds of acres of land. I had thoroughbred horses. I, I took a lot of exotic trips, and I did all of these things. And that's what I did with my life. So church, tell me, which is the tragedy, John's or the attorney? The attorney. Don't waste your life. Live your life for God. Invest your life in the things of God and, and in people. Live it for others. And if you will do that, you will find true meaning and purpose and freedom and joy for your life if you'll learn to invest your life in the things of God. Let me tell you what real freedom is. Real freedom is not doing what you want to do with your life. That's not real freedom. Real freedom is doing what God wants you to do with your life. And when you do what God wants you to do with your life, you will find the peace and the joy that you'll search for many hours and days and weeks and months and years. If you'll just say, God, whatever your will is, I will do it. Amen. That's where joy and completeness is found. Now, what does Paul have to say about this kind of thing? First of all, he says, uh, we will all pay the piper one day. Every one of us. We've all heard that expression, right? You got to pay the piper someday. Look again at verse 7. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. So Paul uses an analogy that all of his hearers completely understood because it was an agriculture culture. They knew about farming. They knew about planting. They knew about harvesting. They knew about reaping. They knew all of that. And Paul says about your life, don't be deceived. And he's giving them a warning right here. And he's saying that there are many people that are misled. And they're not really paying attention to what God desires for you to do with your life. Here's a sad but true story. There are too many Christians these days that just get their fire insurance and they are done at that point. What do you mean, preacher, get your fire insurance? Well, I'll just get saved so that way I won't go to hell. But I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life. If there's not something in you after you've been born again, something inside your soul that tells you you ought to seek out God and live for Him, then it's perhaps you've never been born again. Missionaries will tell you that most American Christians could not survive as a Christian in virtually any other country because it's too hard. And we like our creature comforts, don't we? We like everything to go smoothly and go our way, and we don't want any sacrifice to have to be made for the Lord. So here's what Paul says, God is not mocked. That word mocked is an interesting word that we find there in the New Testament because the word mocked there means thumb. So here's what he's saying. You cannot thumb your nose at God. That's what he's saying. God's not mocked. You can't thumb your nose at God. And here he begins to express a universal truth. He says, if you sow a little, you will reap a little. If you sow a lot, you will reap a lot. So I guess the question I have before us this morning is, what are we sowing? Disunity? There are some church members and some churches that sow disunity among the brethren. The Bible pretty harsh about what's going to happen to those people. There's some that sow disunity at their workplace, some that sow disunity in their neighborhood, some that sow disunity in their own homes. That's not of God. That's not what God has called us to do. Some people are sowing hate. And my, aren't we getting our fill of hate these days? You wake out there, church? I mean, we're living in a world that increasingly hates Christians and hates the church. They would love to eradicate Christianity. They would love to eradicate the church. And they hate us and they despise us. And have you ever heard this old adage that says, divide and conquer? 
Does it ever seem like to you, or maybe it's just me, does it ever seem like to you that the government is trying to pit one race against another race against another race to divide us so that we will hate each other so they can conquer us? Somebody asked me one time, said, do you like black people? And I said, which ones? And they were shocked, like, what, what, what do you mean? I said, I don't like all black people. I like some of them. I don't like all white people either. <laughs> do you? You see, the, here's what's going on right now. They're trying to get us to relate to groups. We don't relate to groups. We relate to individuals. Are you hearing me? That's how we're supposed to relate with one another. You might relate to individuals within a group. Have you ever been a part of a group and you didn't like everybody in that group? No matter what the group is, maybe you're a Rotarian or, or a Lion or this group or that group, whatever it might be. You ever played on a baseball team or a football team and didn't like every person on that team? Now, Pastor, I thought y'all were supposed to like everybody. I got news for you. We don't. Now, I love them, but some of them I like to choke out. <laughs> so all of this is going on right now, and they're dividing us, and sure enough, they are conquering us right now. We cannot let that happen. So what should we sow? How about love? How about kindness? How about friendship? Why don't we sow those things? For the Bible says if we will sow those things, we get all of it back and then some. Because if we sow a lot, we'll reap a lot. So whatever you're sowing right now, whether it be negative or positive, that's what you're going to get back. Every action has a reaction, doesn't it? We reap the consequences of our conduct, and we reap the consequences of our words, what we say to one another. And, and if we sow a wind, we'll reap a whirlwind, is what the Scripture tells us. If we sow wild oats, we're not going to get sweet berries. So what are we sowing? Some people say, well, I just don't believe that, you know. I don't believe that we reap what we sow. I've been sinning for years and years, and nothing's ever happened. Didn't happen to me yesterday. Didn't happen today. It's not going to happen to me tomorrow. I'm not going to reap what I sow. That's just some fairy tale. I just don't believe it. Is that true? And they convince themselves that their day of reaping will never come. Solomon, who God calls the wisest man that's ever lived, said this, when the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. So if they think the day of judgment will never come, then they continue to live a wicked and an evil life. And here's what Paul's saying, I can't tell you when your day of reckoning will come, but I can tell you it will come. It will come. You can count on that. So God one day is going to settle all accounts, isn't he? It's not going to be us who settles the accounts. It'll be God. There was a Christian farmer and an atheist farmer. And the atheist told the Christian farmer one day, he said, you know what? How about we plant exactly the same thing on exactly the same amount of acreage and we'll just see who, who gets the biggest harvest. And you bless God every day and I'll curse God every day and we'll see what happens come October. So October came, and sure enough, the atheist had the better crop. And so he looked at that Christian farmer and said, See, I told you, you're a fool. Now what have you got to say about your God now? And that Christian farmer said, Hey, there's something you don't understand. My God doesn't settle all of his accounts in October. <laughs> Amen? You may not reap today. You may not reap tomorrow. But one day you will. My favorite cousin growing up was, was Dale. Dale's the one that wrote that song. You may have heard it. You're the reason God made Oklahoma. You ever heard that song? He wrote that when number one, the nation. He sold it to the nitty gritty dirt band. They sold it to David Frizzell and Shelley Weston. They recorded it. It went number one, the nation. He sold it for, get this, $1,200. Had a hit song, just didn't know what he had. Dale started drinking when he was 14. And he just never quit. 
The devil wanted to be like his daddy, and his daddy, who was one of my very favorite uncles, never, ever went to church. He didn't. Never darkened the door of a church. Had no use for the church. So when Dale got old enough to make his own decisions about it, at least in his mother's eyes, then he quit going. He continued to run with some people that he should not have been running with. He ran with the wrong crowd, and he wound up getting in trouble after trouble after trouble. So much so that he wound up killing a man one day. And they caught him. Then they put him in prison. And he died in prison. And I did his funeral. One of the hardest funerals I've ever done in my life. See, they might have thought, I, I can do what I want to with my life. I'll never pay the piper. I can live however I want to live. And I, I've got no consequences coming. But he did. He did. You ever know anyone like that? My brother-in-law, his name is Randy. It's Robin's brother. And when Randy was a young man, he decided he wanted to start weight training. And he made me sick. Because he lifted weights and he was shaped like a triangle like that. I am too, except it's the other way. But Randy would go to the gym and he would take those weights, he'd push up and lower them back down, push up and lower them back down, push up and lower them back down. And he gave away strength, but when he was done, he had more strength. He had more strength. He was stronger than he'd ever been. Because before he started weight training, he was about that big around. He was a little skinny guy and he built up these muscles and he's strong. So the, the point is, he was reaping what he had sown. He invested in something so he could get something better back. And here's what Scripture says. Live for God and you will be rewarded. Think about your spouse for a moment. If you live for God and you love your spouse the way you're supposed to love your spouse, they're going to love you back like you cannot even imagine. The reason that so many couples fight all the time and bicker all the time and struggle all the time is because they're not really living for God like they should. And then one person acts and the other person reacts. And it's just a vicious cycle and you can't get out of it. Or at least you think you can't. Live for God and you'll love your spouse like you're supposed to love your spouse. Live for God and your children will grow up and honor you. You live for God at work. And your boss will respect you. Even if they're an atheist themselves, they're going to see that this person is different because they, they do what I tell them to do and they don't gripe or complain about anything. And you just keep on doing that and they will respect you. If you live for God, your neighbors are going to appreciate you because they'll see you're a man or a woman of God. And then Paul says, keep your head up. Verse 9. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. In psychology, this is called the PREMAC principle. This will happen if you do this. Grand, and we call it in layman's terms, grandma's rule. Grandma says, if you will mow the lawn, I will bake you some cookies. And put right out of the oven hot with bluebell ice cream on them. <laughs> so here's what Paul says. Listen to it again. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing. Is that what you want to reap? You will reap a harvest of blessing if, there's the pre-Mac principle, if you don't give up. How many times have we quit just, just shortly before God was going to give us a blessing? Just shortly before God was going to open up the windows of heaven and bless us in some fashion, in some way. And right before he did that, we quit. We got upset and we quit. You see, here's what Scripture is saying. God will honor what you do for God in his time. Sometimes you can get to serving the Lord and you think, well, God's forgotten all about me. Nobody cares what I'm doing. I'm trying to do the right thing here, and it seems like God himself doesn't even really pay any attention whatsoever. Did you know something? Did you know that serving others can be very difficult? How many of you mamas know that? Yeah. How many of you mamas have, have to have a double dose of the Holy Spirit to put up with your husband? Yeah, there you go. 
you're not normally in this service. You may leave. <laughs> and you just don't feel appreciated. You're trying to serve, but you don't feel appreciated. And even the people that you are serving never reciprocate. They might not even be kind to you. So who are you serving? Here's a spiritual maturity test for you. Will you walk with God even when you're in the dark? Will you walk with God even when you can't see the light? Will you stay when you want to leave? Will you sit when you really should stand? Will you fight when you want to run? See, sometimes we forget who we're serving, don't we? And that's why we get upset with people, because people let us down. You ever had a person let you down? We all have, right? We have to remember who we're serving. We're serving the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You see, it's not easy to do that. And sometimes it's not easy for us to do the right thing, such as apologize. Anybody here ever done anything wrong, said something wrong, ugly, mean, whatever? We all have. And sometimes it's just hard to... It's just hard to go up and say, I was wrong. Please forgive me. You ever watch Happy Days? Remember Fonzie couldn't say the word wrong? He'd say, I, I'm, I was, Mrr. I'm sorry, I was, Mrr. he just couldn't say it. That's the way it is with us. We just got to freeze up and we say, I can't apologize. I mean, after all, they started it. Who cares who started it? God cares who's going to settle it. Who's going to be man enough, woman enough, and Christian enough to step up and do what is right. Sometimes it's hard to live selflessly and take advice or admit that you've been wrong or to be charitable or to be considerate or to endure some failure somewhere along life's line or, or to learn from your mistakes. All of those things can be hard, but here's the point. At least try. It's worth it if you'll try. And Paul says, if you'll try, if you don't give up, God will send the harvest at the proper time. Now, whose timing is always best? Our time or God's time? It's always God's time. And sometimes I think we forget that. Have you ever heard of that book called, That's Good, No, That's Bad? It's got all these scenarios in it. Or somebody, something happened, somebody's telling a friend something happened, and they say, oh, that's good. And they say, no, no, that's bad. And then they'll hear, tell whatever it happened next, and they'll say, oh, that is bad. And he said, no, that's good. And she's going back and forth. You see, the truth of the matter is, we can't really judge if something is good or bad until we turn the page. Because sometimes what we interpret to be really bad is, is God laying groundwork for something really good. That's what it is. Discouragement is perhaps the greatest danger that we face as believers. And Paul reminds us, don't give up. He said, you're going to cheat yourself if you quit on God. Don't give up. Some have done that. You, you quit on a friendship. You've quit on a marriage. You, you've given up on your kids. You've quit on work. You just quit. And Paul says, don't lose heart. Keep the faith. Here's the last thing. There will come, and I like this one the best, there will come a day of rejoicing. In verse 10, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. So he's saying that life is full of opportunity. Every single day of your life, God gives you opportunity. That word opportunity means time. And literally translated, he's saying this, as we have time. Time is opportunity. Every single day when you get up, you've got the opportunity to make someone else's life a little bit better. You could go to the hospital and volunteer. You could find some little girl in your neighborhood that wants a doll and go buy her one. You could find some little boy that you know that needs a baseball bat or a baseball glove and go buy him one and make his day. Do something kind for somebody else. And Paul is saying, remember this, time is short, so do something today. Invest in someone else for the sake of the kingdom today. Mow their lawn. 
write a kind note. Make them some barbecue. Anybody here like barbecue? If you don't, you need to come get saved. <laughs> Speak a word of encouragement to somebody and do it today. Don't wait till you get around to it. You ever seen those coins about that big around on the coin that says, a round to it. T-U-I-T. Because that's what we do. Well, one of these days I'll get around to it. And we just never do. You know, one of these days I'm going to apologize when I get around to it. One of these days I'm going to encourage somebody when I get around to it. And we just never get around to it. How about we make a decision that time is opportunity. And you've got an opportunity to do right, right now. To do it today. 